All right, we just finished nine weeks of the 30,000-foot view of the Old Testament. And you can think of the Old Testament in big picture by five couplets. We start with uh, creation and the fall of man, that God's, uh, what God wanted to do was to take the Trinitarian love of Father, Son, and Spirit and infuse that into people to where we would experience that kind of overwhelming, uh, life-giving love uh, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit know with each other to people. And then, uh, and we decided, no, we really don't need that. We, do, we want to do something different. And so off we went. Creation and fall. All of life changed from there. First, two chap- first three chapters of Genesis. Creation, fall. And we move ahead about 12 chapters to the life of Abraham and the covenant that God gave to Abraham that he's going to do something about this sin problem. Uh, and then hundreds of years pass. The people are, because of their sin, are in bondage in Egypt and and then there's Exodus. So you have creation in the fall, Abraham, and Exodus. The next two words you can think of is law and sacrifice. God gave the Ten Commandments, and really a whole lot more commandments than that, that the people were to obey, but the people were not good at obeying. That's a great understatement. And so something needed to be done about this sin problem that, that lies within each one of us and the sacrificial system for sin was instituted as a way of reminding the people, sin is serious, it needs to be taken care of, only blood will do. It's that serious. Creation, fall. Abraham, Exodus. Law and um, sacrifice. Then you could, the next couplet is God's presence and God is king. God came to live with his people. He shacked up, moved in with them. Tabernacle and temple. And he, he, that he came as to be the king. It's not just that people are to be religious, but we need a king in our heart. Him as king, not ourself. Creation and fall. Abraham and Exodus. Law, sacrifice. Presence and king. God's presence and king. The last one is exile and restoration. That the people, even after hundreds of years of hearing the prophets and the warnings of the prophets said... Our sin's really not that bad. Well, we, we can do what we want. We'll be okay. And the prophets kept saying, no, 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 no. You make a terrible error if you look at sin that way. And finally, uh, the people were uh, endured two different uh, invasions and conquering of the nation of uh, Israel and Judah by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They're taken off into exile. But God says, there's hope. There's hope that there's going to be a restoration of my people There'll be a remnant that will come back to the promised land. Uh, And it's just really a symbol of our lives, that there are times when we are at the very end of our rope and we think, you know, I've screwed up so bad, is there any hope for me? That's the exile. And the exile is not the last word. There's restoration that can come, and that's what God is doing in us. Now, that's the Old Testament in sort of five couplets, five big ways to look at it. Now, all of the Old Testament is really the preview for the New Testament. And really the coming of the Messiah. That's what we're going to look at today. Jesus the Messiah. Why do we need a Messiah? Why do we need a Messiah? About 40 years ago, I became a Christian. in My junior year in college. And I remember thinking as a new Christian, I think I know what God wants to do in my life. He wants to, keep, he wants to do something about my drinking problem because I thought I was getting close to being an alcoholic. He wants to do, I got I to get that cleaned up. So I decided... Uh, I'm just gonna. I'm not. I'm just not gonna drink anymore. Just forget that. Thankfully, put that aside. I have to quit sleeping with girls. That was the, the purity thing. I got to get that figured out. And the other thing I thought about was I've got a navy mouth. I've got to get that cleaned up. And I really thought if I could get those three, those three things kind of cleaned up, I'd be in good shape. And over the next year and a half or so, it took me about that long. Got those things cleaned up. Little did I know that those three things were three outward manifestations of a huge inward problem. My heart. I had little idea that what I needed was not just to work out a little bit and sort of buff up my heart. I needed a heart transplant. What I had entered into in my relationship with God, I thought was sort of like... um, when I was a kid, I remember I learned an important lesson with my mother. 
if I had a toothache, I decided that the worst thing I could do was to tell my mother about that. Because I was going to get more solution than I wanted. The first time I did this, I said, Mom, I got a toothache. And so uh, she gave me something, it was aspirin or something, to numb the pain for the toothache. But the next day, we went to the dentist, and I discovered the dentist had a drill <laughs> and shots. Now, all I, bar- all I wanted was relief from pain. What my mom saw and what the dentist saw was you got a bit, lot bigger problem than just the relief of pain. The same was true as a Christian. I just thought I had these three outward manifestations. God, can't you just give me a, a, an aspirin for that? And what God started me on was... 40 years of heart restoration that is still going on today. I didn't need a Messiah just 40 years ago to be saved and to to get ushered into heaven someday. I need a Messiah today to save me from myself and the things that which I am still prone to do uh, if left undone. Uh, Jesus the Messiah arrives. We start... With the, the Gospel of Mark begins the beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert. Here's what he says. Prepare the way for the Lord. It's not just that a good teacher's coming or a good moral man or someone, a good example for us to follow. God himself has come to live on planet Earth. So John came baptizing in the desert region, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, we had a baptism a few weeks ago, uh, Diana, uh, here in the baptistry, and a baptism is a great, is, is, a, is electric. If you have a chance to see somebody going under the water, it's a picture of cleansing of sin, but it's also a picture of dying to the old life and being raised to a new life. Now, but it's just a picture. It's a picture of something that's already happened inside of a person when they come to Christ. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. We become one of his kids, a part of his family. The, the beginning of the change of heart takes place then. Verse 10. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, this is his, his baptism, he saw heaven being torn open. And we have a picture here, one of, three, one of three times in the New Testament, where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, Holy, and God the Holy Spirit, are together relating to one another. Three glimpses, this is one of them. Heaven was being torn open. It's as if the father could hardly constrain himself as he looks down on God the Son, rips open the heavens, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, coming down to empower him, as if to say, the Son is on a mission, and this mission is going to be involve a mission of suffering and death. And I'm coming to, to, to you to empower you to do all that you can to remain true to God during even through your time of suffering and to honor him. A voice came from heaven. One of the few times this happens in, the, in, in all of scripture. And the father says, you are my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Now you may have heard this before. You may have thought, oh, that's cool. But what you get a glimpse of here is a glimpse into heaven, into the Godhead, the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are almost trying to outlove each other, life-giving love back and forth amongst the three. It's a picture of what's supposed, what, how we're supposed to live, being life-giving love to, my, to the people in my life. Uh, when I think about the Father just sort of erupting here, this is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. One of the episodes I think about when, I, when I, my son was uh, probably about... Uh, nine or ten years old, we had a soccer game, and I was not coaching that team, sitting on the sideline with all the parents in their, in their chair, lawn chair, watching the game, and, and Cole took the ball at one end of the field, stole the ball from somebody, and dribbled through about three or four people, and, and then had a breakaway to the goal, and, and back then he had this sort of bowl haircut, you know, blonde hair, and, and it was sort of flying in the wind as he was going, and 
you know, a little short guy, but speedy and fast, and goes down there, and he gets down to the goalie, and dekes out the goalie, puts the ball in the net. And one of the dads goes, wow, who's that kid? And I said, that's my boy. What I also wanted to say was genetic show. <laughs> but I, but I, I resisted the urge to say that. There's something of the same thing here, except on a much grander scale. Now, when you think about why did Jesus come? One of the things I think about is in contrast to the picture we see at the baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, gushing love on one another. I think about what happened in the Garden of Eden. Most of the time we think about Adam and Eve falling, we think about is that they had a bad outward action or they rebelled. They did something wrong. That's certainly true. Uh, but if, if she had not taken the fruit, would things still be okay? Or did something worse, far worse happen in that moment? Genesis tells us in Genesis 3 that when Eve saw that the tree was pleasing to the eye and the fruit desirous for bringing wisdom, she ate. Now, what's he saying? Is he saying that she, there was just an outward action that she disobeyed and she rebelled? No. What he's pointing at is that there was something inside of her that was faulty. In the realm of desire and pleasure that ruled her at that moment. When she saw it, the, the tree was pleasing to the eye and desirous to make one wise, then she chose that. Paul, thousands of years later in, in the book of Timothy says, is that one of our problems is we are lovers of self and lovers of money. What the New Testament would say in general is our problem is we are lovers of self and lovers of anything but God. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's all kinds of other things. We have made the world, circled the world around ourselves and what's important to us. This is an internal love problem. If you might think about this, this, what I'm supposed to do, this love machine inside of me has been twisted. It's been perverted. It makes it, it, everything, I, and whenever I go, I'm trying to make sure that my needs are met first, then your needs. Rather than living in a situation where at any given moment, my greatest desire is to love God and reflect Him. And to do what I can to meet somebody else's needs. That doesn't come naturally now to anyone. That's what's broken. There's something in the human heart that needs to be repaired. Martin Luther, about 500 years ago, great theologian, defines sin as that propensity of man that is now curved in upon himself. It's a great phrase. Verse 14. <clears throat> Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent, believe the good news. I need a new king. This is why he came. How do I get there? I repent. I say, my way of being king is a bad idea. Idea of you being king, a far better idea. And all that's needed is to believe the good news and to follow that king instead of following me. 29. The disciples went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her. Uh, that doesn't normally happen to me. And she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. The idea here in Mark chapter 1 is is that God the Son has invaded planet Earth and he's got all the credentials. Go back to Old Testament prophecy, go to power, what he's proclaiming, what needs to be done in the human heart. In Mark chapter 1, all the big pieces are there. Now, on the inside, let's look at who is Jesus. And there's, there's two things about the New Testament that's really pretty interesting about Jesus. One is he's fully God and at the same time he's fully man. Try to grasp those two things together. 
fully God. Remember back in Genesis 3.15, right after Adam and Eve sinned, and God comes to give the curses, and he speaks to Satan. God says, I will put enmity, which means hatred, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Now, that's sort of, if you were living back in the time of Moses and you would, you would look at that, you'd go, that sounds pretty, a little vague there, a little mysterious. What it does is it looks forward to several things. He says, I will put enmity between the woman, between your offspring. Who's her offspring? It's not just that her son or grandson, but there's going to be a line all the way from the the Garden of Eden, all the way down several thousand years later that you can trace in the Old Testament, all the way down to Jesus. Uh, Her offspring will come from um, down through all those generations. At the end of the verse, he says to Satan, you will strike his heel. Remember, Satan shows up as a snake, portrayed as a snake. If you're out in the desert uh, and you're walking through a path, you're not careful, a rattlesnake bites you, he's probably going to bite you in the heel. And what the rattlesnake would hope and what Satan would hope is that he's going to put enough venom into the person that they're going to die. Now, what's he describing here? God says to Satan, there's going to come a time when you're going to strike this, my son's heel. And what you're going to think is you've put enough venom in him to kill him. That's the crucifixion. That's the cross. And as Jesus hung there several thousand years later, I'm sure Satan was off to the side going, we win. He's done. There's no hope now for humanity. But listen also what he says in Genesis 3.15. He says, he will crush your head. If you're out, uh, I was out in the desert one time with uh, some uh, fraternity brothers years ago, and one of the guys brought an axe with him. I thought it was kind of strange to walk through the desert with an axe. Until we discovered some rattlesnakes. And it was his good pleasure to take that axe to the back of the head of rattlesnakes and do it in. That did it. Rattlesnakes were no longer dangerous. What he's saying is, Satan, you're going to have your day to strike his heel but I'm going to have the last word. The last word came at the, at the resurrection of Christ three days later. A fatal blow was struck to the head of Satan. He's not yet dead, but it's a mortal blow. He's in the process of dying, writhing in the death gasps. Still at work with us, trying to get us to, to turn away from God, but he will win. God will win. Uh, Matthew 6.15, Jesus is talking with the disciples. He said, there's dialogue of who do men say that I am? A lot of us in our culture today, you ask who, peop- who you think Jesus is, oh, he's a good moral man. He's a good teacher. Or he was a rabbi or an example for us all to follow. If Jesus was only those things, we are wasting our time right now. Because all of us need something more than a moral example or someone to try to emulate. Not something outward. We need something inward. Who do you say that I am? And he asks, what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. In other words, he got it. Deity. Uh, Some of the Old Testament prophecies describe the deity of the Messiah. Bethlehem Ephratah where Jesus would be born. Ye who are small among the clans of Judah, one will come from you to be a ruler over Israel for me. And notice what he says. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Not just a baby that we celebrate at Christmas. His origin came from way before that, way before the creation of the world. God the Son invading. Jeremiah says the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I rise, when I raise a righteous branch of David, he will reign wisely as king and administer justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. This is what he will be named. The Lord is our righteousness. And the word Lord there is the Old Testament word that says is Yahweh. 
This one that's coming is equated with Yahweh, God the Father and God the Son. Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, a son will be given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. In, in the, uh, there are two words for God mainly used about God in the Old Testament, Yahweh and El. El. That's the one used here for God. And then mighty is the, is the Hebrew word gibor, which means the conquering God, conquering king. And eternal father, Messiah, equated with God the Son, as if they are one. Prince of peace, fully God, but he's also fully man. In John chapter 4, Jesus is on his way uh, through Samaria. Uh, it's a hot day. It's about noon. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired as he was from the journey. He sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Though he was fully God, he was also fully man. It's a hot day. He needs water. He needs to sit down. Matthew 4, 2. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, I love this. Matthew says, he was hungry. Man, if I miss my mid-morning snack, I'm not pleasant to be around. Nope. <laughs> there it is, a word of testimony. John 11, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Fully God and fully man at the same time. But he's also the fulfillment of God's plan. Paul, in the book of Galatians, says this. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. That we might sit around that table one day with him. Not with our heads bowed, not coming dragging in, well, thanks for saving me, I know I didn't deserve it. Not like that. That we would understand the wonder of grace and be able to walk in with our head held high. Not because we're proud, but because we're grateful. Who would love somebody like me? Wow, is the idea. After the resurrection of Jesus, he was talking with two of the disciples that were sort of uh, on the fringe of the group, and they didn't recognize him at first. Who would have thought that he was alive? They all thought he was dead. They're having a discussion. And he says to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. No, this really shouldn't be a surprise that there's a resurrection. He tells them four things. First of all, this is what I told you while I was still with you. At least seven times in the Gospels, he has a conversation with the disciples that I'm going to suffer and die and rise again. And he reminds them of that thing here. What I told you while I was with you, too. Everything must be fulfilled. All the prophecies that go back up to 2,000 years have to find their fulfillment, he says, in me. The idea is, go check it out. See if there's anybody else that matches all those fulfillment, those prophecies of fulfillment like I do. Number three, that is written about me. The Messiah is now a person, a name, a face. And then four, Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, the idea is, no matter where you took, take a look in the Old Testament, you're going to find me there if you look hard enough. Remember in Genesis 3, he said, God said to Satan, he will crush your head. A couple of verses in the New Testament pick up on the same theme. Look at Colossians 2. Having disarmed the powers and authorities. This is the cross and resurrection where he disarmed Satan, took away his weapons, so to speak, and the authorities, meaning Satan and, and the demons. He made a public spectacle of them. He embarrassed them publicly. In other words, see, 
What the idea here is, is through the cross and resurrection, he's saying to people, you follow your own ways and your own desires. That's what Satan wants you to do. And what you're going to see is that way is the way of foolishness. That's the way of embarrassment. That's the way to, to, to make a train wreck of your life. We had a public spectacle of that. And triumphing over them by the cross. Ultimately, as Christians, we are on the winning side. Romans 16 picks up on this even more specifically. The God of peace will soon crush Satan. And then notice the next phrase. Will crush Satan under your feet. In other words, you have a role to play in this. And so do I. It's not just that God is going to defeat Satan, but he's also going to defeat Satan through the lives of his people. As we say no to sin and no to Satan. On the back of your handout, uh, Jesus is the solution to our sin problem. As for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins in which you used to live. When you follow the ways of this world, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is not working, those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. See, what he's describing is, it's not just that we have an outward problem, there's an inward problem that's going on. This motor inside that keeps moving me towards my desires, what I want to do, how I want to feel, how life seems at the given moment. And we give in to those things, we make a mess of things. Following its desires and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. Nobody can try harder to, do, to change anything inside of you. You can try harder to change the outside, diet, exercise. Okay. But how am I going to change the inside of me? It's impossible. It's by grace you have been saved through faith, this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, you can know all of this about Jesus Christ. But until you do what he said, which is repent, to turn away from this way of living, from you as king, you as arbiter, you as lord of your life, following your desires, what you think ought to be done, turn away from that to him as king, all of this is worthless. It's not enough just to know these things. You've got to follow him as your king. Paul in the book of Acts says, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, 2,000 years of history, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God. So your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Christ who is appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. We sang about that just a few minutes ago. He is restoring my heart. If you know him, he's in the process of restoring your heart. The inner works that need to be redone as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Do I have just an outward problem? Or is there something more inside of me that needs to be fixed? A friend of mine was talking to an associate pastor at a large, large church in our country. And this fellow's job at his church was the pastor of family ministry. Sounds like a fun job. Pastor of family ministry. And he confided to my friend privately he said, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm uh, in my early 40s. He said, and it's pretty sad because I'm the, fam the pastor of family ministry and my wife and I are not close and I have no idea what to do about it. Is that an outward problem or an inward problem? It's an inward problem. And the inward solution might be to look at the baptism where the father tears open the, the heavens and shouts down to his son, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. I wonder what that, if he had an image of that in his head, how he'd want to treat his wife 
or what he'd want to say to her. There's an inward solution that's needed, and it has to do with Messiah. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life. Not physical life, life in the heart. Not death, life in the heart. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are not just a good teacher, a moral man, an example to follow. That's not the problem I have. I do not have a knowledge problem. It's not I don't, it's, it's not that I, I just need to know what to do. Or I just need some motivation to do it. Or I need to try harder. That is not my problem. My problem is a heart problem. That I can do nothing on my own to solve. It's only the Messiah, the life that is in Jesus Christ himself, that can come in to me if I will allow him and to slowly fix all that is wrong inside of me, though it take me all my life. That's what I need. Jesus Christ, I needed you 41 years ago. And I'm glad I met you then. But Jesus Christ, I need you just as much today to keep me from turning away from you and being ruled by my desires and pleasures and passions. I would make an utter wreck of my life within a few weeks. But I have found life and tasted it in you. And how could I turn anywhere else? Only you have the words of life.